introduction it's it's uh oh this meeting is being recorded got it I'm, yeah I'm so I'm excited to hear that it's it's great to be here with all of you and I really am honored to be a part of this seminar series there are a lot of great talks scheduled uh it's it's exciting to to be here um I also want to thank before I get started so I'm going to be talking about type cones and I'm also going to kind of focus on well or at least towards the end the goal is to get to product of simplices, so specific type of polytope. Um, I think the talk is slightly differently titled on my slides than versus online. Um, so that's that's uh, that's my bad. But so the the talk is based on a work with my collaborators, Federico Castillo, Joseph Doolittle, Michael Ross, and Li Ying, who are various points around the world. And our paper is called Minkowski Summons of cubes. I think it finally was published uh, over the summer, or you know, sometime over the summer it was published. And um, I actually, when I was preparing for this talk, I um, I saw that this was a matroid seminar, and I, I quickly control F the word matroid in our paper. And there are unfortunately very few matroids listed in our paper, but there are, I, I assure you, there are matroids hanging around. We're talking about polytopes, point sets, hyperplane uh, arrangements. So so hopefully you'll you'll find something interesting for, for any of us here. Um, and please, during my talk, feel free to interrupt me at any point, and I'm happy to chat and answer questions. Um, but I'd, I'd like to, to start with just a, a reminder, a definition of, of the main pieces of the puzzle here, which are polytopes. So a polytope in RD, I want to think about in potentially two different ways, either as the convex hull of finitely many points, Uh, that says many, oh, or or the bounded key intersection of finitely many half spaces. Mm, let me spell half correctly. Uh huh. And please let me know at any point if what I'm writing on the, the screen is, is, is hard to, to read. Uh, so for example, if I take, you know, say some points in, let's imagine these are in R3 for a second, and I take four affinely independent points, I get something like this. This is my three simplex here. Okay, so that's one way to think about it. Or, you know, instead, maybe I, I take some bounding hyperplanes. So I have one up here on top. I have a few on the sides. And I, I end up with this triangular prism. So these are these are examples of polytopes that are in R3 and they're three-dimensional. And what I'm going to focus on here are the, the faces of my polytope. So the face is just the intersection of P with a, I'll say, supporting hyperplane. Let's see, how does the yellow look? It looks okay on my screen, but perhaps it doesn't on yours. Let me know if that's not the case. Um, so for example, if I want to think about what my faces are in my polytope, I could take a plane that intersects this polytope right along that line segment. So this is, this is an edge right here. That's one of my faces. Or I could take another plane that maybe intersects just at this single vertex. Or maybe over here, I could take a plane that intersects just this triangular face down here. And when I talk about a, a face that's kind of as large as possible without being the full polytope, this is called a facet. And to be supporting just means that my my polytope lives on one side or the other. This it's not cut in two by this, right? The the only intersection is right on the plane itself, or on one side of the plane itself. Um, and just one special type of faces that I really like are k simplices. So a k simplex, it's just k plus one affinely independent spaces, or excuse me, affinely independent uh, points. And then I take the convex hull. Okay, so oops, 
that has, well, imagine there's a second L there. So for example, a zero simplex, a one simplex, a two simplex, a three simplex up here. Okay, so these are these are our main characters. And what I what I want to care about is kind of polytopes that have some sort of similarities, but you know, maybe there's some amount of ambiguity on how similar they are. So this leads me to an idea of combinatorial isomorphism. So what I start with is I take the face poset of a polytope. And I say, well, this is the set of faces of P ordered by inclusion. So, you know, going back to this picture, this edge contains those two vertices, the triangle, there are two triangles that contain this edge. So my post set would encode this, this structure. And then the, the idea of a combinatorial isomorphism, right? So the combinatorial isomorphism is just P and Q are, I'll say, combinatorially isomorphic if their face post sets are isomorphic. And for me, for this project, the kind of the main kind of motivating question is just the simple following imprecise, very imprecise question, right? If, if P and Q are combinatorially isomorphic, Well, how different can they be? So this is the imprecise bit, right? What do I mean by they? What do I mean by, by this? How different? Well, first I wanna, I wanna show you a couple of examples of some combinatorially isomorphic uh, polytopes and convince you, right, that there is some, some maybe subtlety. Um, so let's see, so for example, um, sorry, I've lost track of, I don't have a easy clock. Okay, there we go. Um, so for example, I want to think about cubes. So cube here is just any polytope that is combinatorially isomorphic to the standard cube. So the standard cube, I just take all the points in between zero and one. So for example, if D is equal to three, I get some object like this, right? I get six-sided like a die from a board game. And the one property that is not surprising to anyone, but I want to highlight, I think it's, it's relevant, is that if I take these, if I take any pair of opposing facets on the standard cube, it has this really nice property that any, any pair of opposing facets, they are parallel. So parallel here, parallel here, parallel there. Okay. And then there are, of course, other sorts of cubes. So for example, I could, there's this classic one called the Klee Minty cube. The idea is what Klee and Minty did is they took a, a standard cube and they kind of perturbed the vertices. So we still have the same sort of, uh, Oops, we have the same sort of, of combinatorial structure here, right? We have this face post set that's the same, but the vertices have been perturbed somewhat so that if you say run the simplex algorithm and you, you, pick, uh, you, you pick unluckily, you might actually have to visit all of the vertices of the Clementi cube when you're, when you're trying to do optimization problems. Okay, so this is, this is a, bit, a bit perturbed, a bit different. I wanna show you what in my mind is a really wild uh, sort of cube. Uh, it's this one right here. And actually, I would like to show you an interactive graphic here. So I actually have something, uh, if, you, if you want to kind of play along with this uh, cube at home, I'm going to put a link in here. Uh, so you can click on this link. This is a, a link to a web applet. I'll open it up as well in here. And you can, you can see what's happening with this cube. So let me see here. Uh, I'm gonna... So I claim that this thing right here is also a cube. And you can go and check and you say, um, this thing, if I, if I go through and look, it really does have the same structures here. I have a bunch of quadrilaterals and I have kind of opposing facets here. So for example, here's a supporting hyperplane that hits this quadrilateral. And if I think about the other four vertices of this polytope, I get this. And I can go through and I can check all of these that I really do have the same combinatorial structure as a standard cube. But the, the wild thing about this particular combinatorial cube is if I take these sets of opposing facets, so here's one uh, facet, here's its opposing facet, 
unlike for the standard cube, when I look at these facets, they actually form a right angle. So they're actually perpendicular. So in the standard cube, right, I mean, my opposing facets are all parallel with each other. But here, every, every pair of opposing facets, I can turn on some other opposing facets, happen to be perpendicular. So here, the geometry is quite different from, from what you might kind of expect from the standard uh, cube. Well, let me see if I can get, get back. Apologies. I have two different machines running here. Um, so if you're interested, feel free to, to play around with that. You can kind of mess uh, with it. As much. Oh, yes. So what's what's uh, then the definition of being an opposing facet? Uh, so opposing facet means, so I have I have a bunch of vertices that that span one face. And then I take the complement and I look at the, the rest of those vertices and I say, what, what do they span? So in, in the cube, you can do that, right? You can, okay, I understand. Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So you you take like these, these four vertices, define a face, and then you take the other four vertices. And so so you can you can do this. And in higher dimensions, this works as well. You can keep going. Yeah, thanks. Um, okay, so there's there's some amount of subtlety here is, is the point that I want to make. Um, and so I want to make my question a little bit more precise, right? How do I actually, how do I get rid of that? All right, my screen is taken up by Zoom telling me that I'm sharing. Yes, I know. Well, how do I make this question more precise? There are a couple ways to do it. One is by looking at the realization space of my polytopes. And the idea is I pick some polytope and I look at the space of all polytopes that have this isomorphism, right, between face post sets. And this is relatively well studied. One thing that I want to really highlight is this has really wild topology in general. And in fact, I mean, when, when my polytopes get to be large enough, in this case, dimension equals four, uh, any you know, homotopy type could appear. And this is this is due to something called Nev's universality theorem. But so kind of if if you have any strange topological space, you can realize it as the realization space of a polytope. So these, these can be quite, quite poorly behaved in general. Um, but there's, there's this nice, quite recent result um, due to Kareem Adepresito, uh, Danny Kalmanovich. Oh, let me just. And Iran Nevo is from. 19 uh, that says, well, the realization space of cubes, so I'll say the realization space of the D cube is contractible. So it's been a while since you've thought about topologies. Think, just think of something very, very topologically simple, even though in general, these can be quite wild. Okay, so that's, that's a nice result. Um, what I wanna focus on for today's talk is what are called the type cones. And so here I start with a polytope P and I say, okay, well, I'm going to study other polytopes that are also combinatorial equivalent to P, but I'm also going to force the facet normals to be the same. So I can no longer play this game where my facets are moving around. The only thing that I can do is kind of translate facets, like move them back and forth and see what happens here. And I'll say, in, in, in this talk, um, I'm going to allow for, uh, I'll say this, I'll, I'll take the closure of this object, actually. So the type cone itself, if I just take kind of the open type cone, it's only comprised of polytopes that have exactly a combinatorial isomorphism between them. But here, if I take the closure, what will happen is I will get degeneracies on the boundary. And I'll show you some examples, degeneracies on the boundary. And this is a relatively less uh, well-studied object. Um, there's some things kind of in the last few decades here and there, some, some sporadic things about the type cones. In the last few years, I think there's been a, a lot of interesting things coming out. Kind of the first one that I'm, I'm aware of from the last few years is due to Pedro, Palou, um, Pilaud, and Plamondon. I apologize. For my uh, French pronunciation here, Plum and Dom, also from 2019, and and they they were looking at type cones and they were like considering what are called simplicial type cones. Oh, I apologize. There we go. 
Oh, there's something about being at the right at the bottom of my screen here that I. And, and they were in particular motivated by um, some scattering phenomenon in particle physics and somehow trying to give a mathematical foundation to what's happening, looking at type cones, these deformation spaces that are themselves very, very simple. So here I'm thinking about contractible as topologically very simple and simplicial is like geometrically or combinatorially very simple. And, and so there are, there are a bunch of other cool things about the type cone. If you're interested in algebraic geometry, there's a toric variety associated with a, a polytope and the type cone is the nest cone of this toric variety. Uh, there, there are a lot of other kind of pieces to this puzzle. And I, I think that there are a lot of ways to get interested in this thing. Um, but to do that, to, to, to tell you more about the type cone, I wanna tell you a couple different ways that we can think about this. And this is where our, our paper title comes from. This is uh, the idea of a Minkowski sum and a Minkowski sum and. So if I just take two polytopes Q and R in you know, D space, their Minkowski sum is, well, Q plus R is just all the points where I take a point in Q, I take a point in R, and I add them together. All right, so this is the Minkowski sum. And if I start with two polytopes, I will always get another polytope. So for example, here is my polytope Q. Here is my polytope R. My polytope Q plus R, which I'll call P is, you can think about it this way, take one of those triangles and kind of move it around the other triangle everywhere that that other triangle could be and kind of trace out what object you get and you get this Minkowski sum. It's one of the most like fundamental foundational operations you could do on polytope. And then to reverse the process, I could say this, I can say Q is a, and I'll put in parentheses, weak, I'll say Minkowski sum and. So Q is a Minkowski sum and of P. If, well, there exists an polytope R, and I'll say, well, to be weak, and a scalar lambda, such that, well, Q plus R is equal to P, right? So just can I undo this operation? And, and to, to be a weak Minkowski sum and, I just put these things in parentheses. So a weak Minkowski sum and is, well, Q plus R is actually some dilation, either bigger or smaller. Okay, so this is adding two things and then trying to undo this addition. And it turns out that this is one really nice way to think about the type cone. Remember the type cone I said was combinatorial isomorphic plus same facet normals. And so here is this theorem uh, due to Shepard. Uh, this appears, I think the, the spot I know it from is, is in Grunbaum's convex uh, polytopes book. And okay, there's a lot of text on the screen. I Really what I want to emphasize is, well, that I've read Grunbaum's book and you should too if you're interested in polytopes. But the thing is I can think about a Minkowski sum and in a couple different ways. One, using that definition. Two, something about scaling edge lengths. So I take my original polytope P, I scale the edge lengths. And if I get a polytope Q, that polytope is a Minkowski sum in. Or I could think about it in terms of facet heights, take my polytope P, move around the facets. And if I end up with another polytope that I have to be something, I'll show you what I mean. There's something, there's some additional thing you have to be careful with. If I end up with another polytope that doesn't have kind of new vertices, I've also got a, a weak Minkowski sum in. So there, there are three different ways about it. And this ties into the type cone because, well, type cone is all kind of about right, facet heights. I'm only allowed to, to translate my facet. Okay, so, so to give a picture of what these things are happening. So for example, um, so here's my polytope P, the standard three cube. And what I could do is I could take all of these edge lengths here, the vertical edges, and I could scale them, I could scale to zero. And then I get this polytope that's just uh, quadrilateral. And right, so this polytope Q is a Minkowski sum and of, of P because Q plus, well, the line segment R, that line segment that I shrunk down gave me that polytope. Okay, so that's one way to think about it, is scaling my, giving every edge a non-negative weight and then seeing does that create a polytope. 
Another way to do this is, is to take my original polytope, P. Here, I'm going to start with, I like to think of this as like my uh, like Toblerone polytope or something like that. Right? Or like it's like a tent or something like that. So here's P. And what I could do is I could like take this, this bounding hyperplane that, that gives my, me that triangle, and I could push that triangle forwards. And that triangle, if I push it all the way until I hit something else, I come down to this, this triangle with, a, excuse me, this pyramid with a square base, Q. And so Q plus, well, I guess in this case, it's another line segment. Right? These are relatively simple Minkowski sum ends, uh, gives, me, gives me P. And the thing that I just want to be careful with is that if I'm moving these facets around, I can't go the other way around in this case, because I can't, when I'm moving my facets, introduce new, new vertices. So I'd say here, Q is a Minkowski sum and of P, but not the other way around. P is not a Minkowski sum and of Q, because if I, if I move the facets to get from Q to P, I introduce some new vertices. Okay. So these are various ways to think about Minkowski sum and, oh, sorry. Yeah. So for the edge length, do you mm -hmm. also have a condition like you don't introduce a new facet? Because if I just increase one edge of well, the cube. Yeah, so the way I should think about this is, is like I take my original polytope P and I have the edge lengths, whatever they are. And all I'm allowed to do is, is like I write down for each edge, I say, how much am I going to scale this by? I write this down. And then I say, well, if I took those edges, do they still form a polytope? Because if I only scale one edge, what's going to happen is I just like get something up here. And now I say, well, those are not, this is not the edge set of a polytope. So that's what you do. You check once you've scaled the edges, is the resulting thing a polytope rather than rather than scale them and then take so, the so yeah, the convexity condition says you, yeah, okay. I understand. Right, exactly. And so yeah, that's 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 nice there. And this is nice for computations to just be able to, to scale those. Yeah, thanks. Um, okay, so I have these three ways of thinking about it. And so let me say the way that I'll just for this talk, you know, officially define these is the type cone is just the set of all weak Minkowski sum ends. Of P. And you know, each point, I'll say this, right? Each point in my type cone is some realization, right? Corresponds to a realization. And then the, the type polytope, and this really encodes exactly the same information, I just take that type cone and I'll, I'll say slice that type cone with, and I'll just say an appropriate hyperplane. I'll show you some pictures on, on, on what I mean by this. And this, this, um, this encodes the same information. And so this one really is, I'll say, technically up to translation here. Because if I, if I take two Minkowski sums, like maybe it pushes my polytope here or there, I kind of want to just think about these things as translation invariant. And so this type polytope will be the, the weak Minkowski sum ends up to translation and also dilation. Essentially, this is what's happening is I'm kind of fixing, I'm fixing like the edge lengths or something like that. I'm saying that the edge lengths have to add up all to a certain value, and that's going to be my scaling factor. Okay, um, so let me show you an example of how to keep, compute one of these. And I've got another interactive graphic for this one as well. Um, so here is my, my polytope P that I start with. And what I want to do with P is start moving around its facet heights, because this is one way to think about the Minkowski sum ends or to think about these uh, elements in my type cone. And let's say, for example, I pick um, this, uh, let's, let's, pick, uh, let's pick this facet right here. And let's just like move this facet to the left. And I keep moving and I keep moving and I keep moving. And eventually I get down and my facet moved to the left. Now I have something that's no longer combinatorially isomorphic, right? I've lost a face here and I get this object. And I keep playing this game. I pick a facet, I move it around until I reduce down to something that's 
not combinatorial isomorphic. So for example, maybe from this one and that I was just looking at, I take that uh, facet and I move it up and I eventually get down to, to this. I've, I've moved it up and I've lost another face. And so down here at the bottom, these are, these are what are called indecomposable. And they correspond, they are exactly these polytopes that don't have, that they're all of their Minkowski sum ends are trivial. The only way to, to break that up into smaller pieces is to like do something like, well, itself plus a point or itself plus itself and you get a dilation. Um, so so this is this is what the object looks like. And this is exactly the face post set. When I, when I take all these things, face post set of the type polytope. And on the, the right, what I've done here is I've actually shown you where these different things live. So for example, so here, this is the face post set of a triangle. I have the triangle itself up top. I have three edges. I have three vertices. And I've labeled on here where these different things exist. So any point in the interior of this triangle does actually correspond to the original polytope. And then as I start moving and I hit the boundary, now it gives me some sort of deformation here, some sort of degeneracy. And I eventually, when I get to these vertices, these give me my indecomposable. And so if you're interested in um, playing around with this one as well, I, um, I have another one. You'll notice that the color scheme is a little bit different since I just moved institutions. I've, I've changed the color scheme of my slides, but not um, my, uh, my GeoGebra images here. This is the same sort of thing here. So I actually have on the right, I have my type cone. So it's just, I haven't sliced my polytope. And on the left, what I can do is I can move around these bounding facets and I actually see the point in my type cone move around. And so if I get to a point where, you know, I've, I've got to this point now, I have something that's combinatorial differently, different. I, I look and I say, ah, well, this point in my type cone corresponds to being on the boundary. It's no longer in the interior. And I could keep going. I could say something, get down to move until I hit this triangle. Don't want to go too far. I need to make sure that my facets still all bound it. And now I've hit a ray, right? So my rays correspond to these e in decomposable. And so this is the kind of game that we play in general. I, I start with my, my polytope and I see what kind of deformations can I do and what I get out is my, my, my type cone. Okay. Oh yes, and I have this. I have this picture here to remind myself to to tell you about this. Um, okay, so I think I think the plan is for me to talk another twenty or so minutes. Is that correct, Ahmed? Well, I can't hear you, but hopefully you gave me a thumbs up or something. Sorry. Yes. 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 Okay. All right. Great. So I want to tell. I have a couple of the the main thing that I want to eventually tell you about is well products of simplices tell you about how type cones work there. Um, but maybe just since we have a bit of time, I'll, I'll show you a couple of other, what I think are, are, are neat results that, that we found. Uh, so one is if I just look at polygons, so I'm just starting with that, that pentagon that I had a second ago or a hexagon or whatever. My son last night was drawing with chalk and he drew a single line on the ground and he pointed at it and he said, hexagon. And my wife was like, well, obviously that's wrong. Like that doesn't make any sense. And I thought, oh, but wait a second. Ah, I could actually start with a hexagon and I could deform it and get a, a single line. So maybe he's onto something. So I really appreciated that. I, I wish he could be here and assist me on this. Um, but let me tell you, what is the, what is the deal with polygons here? And there, right, what kind of deformation is going to be with them? And it turns out that we can completely classify these. It's not too bad to do this thing. Um, and so I'll just say N of P, this is the set of unit facet normals of P. And so for example, from this um, polytope on the left, so for example, I have this facet corresponds to that vertex, this facet corresponds to that vertex. And I, I get I get a, a I get a point for each one of these, put them on the unit circle. And what we what we were able to show, so this is due to Federico Joseph myself, uh, Mike, and Lee, uh, we were able to show that the faces of the type cone, or if you prefer, the type polytope, correspond to, I'll say, sets. So this is specifically for a, a polygon, right? P is a polygon. 
the simplest case that we could hope to think about, corresponds to, to sets of, of vertices here, uh, excuse me, sets of, of points in my, my this normal configuration, uh, such that the origin is in the relative interior of the convex hull here, of these points. So for example, if my, my points are exactly uh, those two things, right? I take the convex hull and I say, ah, oh, the convex hull is right here. The origin is in the relative interior. So that, that says that essentially that exactly this, that, that this, the polygon corresponding to just those facets. So in this case, I just have this facet, this facet, this one Q is a Minkowski sum and of P. And so I could go through and for example, another one I could say is you know, something like this point, or actually, how about I say this point, this point, and this point, that one corresponds to, well, take this, this, and that. And again, I see, ah, well, the origin is in my relative interior. So if I take those, those facets and I can build a polytope out of this, this is R, that one is also Minkowski sum and here. Um, and so if you're looking at this and you're saying, ah, that looks like a Gale dual or a Gale transform, if you're familiar with that, that's essentially, I mean, there's, there's a kernel of exactly what's happening there. And in particular, you can actually say from a corollary here that like any, I'll say D polytope with at most D plus three vertices is the type polytope for some some polygon P. So just right when it when we're in the polygon case, the simplest thing you can hope for, it does have this nice solution. You just look at this configuration and 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 look at these convex holes. Okay, so that's that's nice. And it also let us answer, maybe I'll quickly say a question here is well, what if I do this? I say fix an N gon, consider all. So fix an N, consider all N gons, which um, has the, I'll say most deformations. You know, another way of saying this is, you know, just like the, the I'm maximizing the F vector of the type polytope. And we thought, you might think that you, if you take, so for example, they, these are hexagons. So notice I've, these are those, those point sets corresponding to the facets. So here's the regular hexagon. You can go through and count. And so, so it looks like something like this. I get a facet here, facet here, facet here, facet here, facet here, facet here. So there's my regular hexagon. Uh, this one I like to describe as kind of like the pizza slice hexagon where I put tons of facets over on this side, and then like two big ones here, kind of. So I, I get something that's rounded, well, almost rounded like in, and then like a little slice here. Um, and then this one is kind of the perturbed. I just ever so slightly notice these ones. I move just a few vertices here from the regular. So this is perturbed regular. And, and you can actually see, um, well, for, n greater than or equal to six, the perturbed regular maximizes the f vector of the type polytope, considering all around. Because like the regular one, well, when I look, I, I have these cases where, for example, if I if I take the point configuration corresponding to say these points, say zero is not in my relative interior. But when I play that same exact game over here and I just take like these little bit of per perturbations, I need to be, I, I picked a bad example, but I can pick this one, say um, this one and, oh, I apologize. Uh, all right, let's let's pick this one, this one, and this one, right? So these were these ones were opposing vertices right here, and normally, right, I would have had the same problem where zero is in the relative interior, but I just 
ever so slightly move it a bit. And so now zero is in my relative interior. And I get, as n grows, I get many more faces if I just do this little perturbation. Turns out not to matter when n is odd, but for even n, we can do these little perturbations and say, these ones uh, answer this question. Okay, so, so polygons are, are interesting, but maybe not the main event. Um, since I have a few more minutes, maybe I'll tell you one other example that I really like, just to, to give you a sense that like type cones are hard to calculate in general, right? We can do it for polygons. So then, then, then we next say, well, what about, you know, platonic solids, right? AKA the, the regular, regular three polytopes. And, and I'll say there are some, okay, the, the simplex, any, it turns out any simplicial thing is not interesting. They just, they're indecomposable. Um, the cube, not interesting, right? So we say icosahedron also simplicial. So, I mean, well, they're, they're simple enough, but it turns out out of all of the um, platonic solids, the dodecahedron is kind of an interesting one to look at. So, so here is, if I think about my uh, edge weights. So remember I take every, every edge, of my polytope and I scale it by some amount. And in here, um, the alphas and betas and gammas, I could tell you what they are, but you know, there's something you can calculate. What I want you to notice is basically we've we've taken a single edge here and we've contracted it down. Every other edge still exists. So one way to think about this instead of in terms of edge weights, in terms of facet heights, is I take my dodecahedron, I take two pentagons that are joined by an edge but not touching, and I push them together until they meet up in this in this vertex right here. So this this edge right here shrinks to zero. It, it closes up. So this is a this is a deformation of my polytope. I haven't moved around my. I've only translated my facets. Or I've only shrunk my edge weights, and that that corresponds to a this thing right here. This is a facet of I'll say the type polygon of the dodecahedron, and down here, this is the f vector of the type polytope. And the facets of the f vector, so this is like vertices. So just like I'm, I'm building the same object that I had with the pentagon, here's for the, uh, the type polytope of, of this more complicated thing. So my vertices here, my edges are the next one, two faces, three faces, et cetera. Down here to facets, of my type polytope. And notice this number is 30. Well, there are exactly 30 edges of the dodecahedron, so we know, so we know all facets of this object. Right? For this this type polytope, we asked a computer, we asked Sage to compute this, and it said, ah, like we can tell you this F vector. It's kind of hard to know what these are all corresponding to, but we know just looking at this picture, well, that the facets of my type polytope of the dodecahedron are exactly when I take a single edge and I smash it down. And I think also, um, I could be misremembering, I can't remember if any of my co-authors are here in the audience. I think we know this one too. I think we know all of the, the next level down how to explain these. Um, but one thing I wanna point out that I just, I don't know, I think is you know somewhat remarkable is that of these, these vertices of my type polytope here, we know, slash understand exactly six of these. So out of all 278 vertices of the type polytope for this object, I can explain to you exactly six of these. And, and surely, you know, if I sat down and worked through, I could come up with some more, but there's kind of like 30 obvious facets, 375 obvious next dimension down, semi-obvious. And when we get down to vertices, well, we can understand exactly six of them. They correspond to these in, in decomposable uh, sum ends here. So even with the dodecahedron, it's it's it gets quite complicated to know what all these different uh, objects are, which then leads me to ah the last part of my talk, hitting this uh, hitting a product of simplices, um, and and just to to give you a sense of of what's going on here, a, a product of simplices is I take two simplices, for example, I take the uh, I take the line segment, that's a one simplex. I take a triangle, my two simplex. And for example, what I'd get out of these is that triangular prism from before. Okay, so any any polytope that can be realized as, as you know, the product of some number of simplices, that's what I'm gonna be thinking about. 
And I want to think about what is what is the type cone of these objects? You know, does it can I somehow think about that product structure and and then piece it piece my type cone together there? And I'll say, by the way, each simplex, each simplex alone, it has a trivial type cone or type polytope. So you know, it would be great if I could say, well, look, this one's trivial, this one's trivial, therefore the whole thing is is essentially trivial or you know, some some slight modification. Of it. And so we we found this result of McMullen's um, from quite a while ago. This result is essentially it might it might not quite be phrased in terms of type polytopes, but it essentially is exactly saying something about type polytopes. And what it says is if I take my polytope. So here is kind of the, the structure of this. I take my polytope, and then I form what's called its polar dual, so it's the dual polytope. And then I take the Gale transform, the Gale diagram of that. Then what I can do from that is I can intersect various things to get faces of the type polytope. And so this has been, all right, I, I look, I do these intersections, I take all these various, I take complements of facets, and all these intersections together, I can eventually compute the type polytope. Okay. And that's nice, and that's that's cool, and and it's a great, it's a great result. And it as far as I know, really hasn't been used much. It's possible people are aware of other uh places in the literature, but as far as I know, it's kind of one of these things that we can apply it, but it's it's not clear once I apply it, like can I can I clearly use it or, or get anything done? So idea. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, so does is this what you use to compute to ask Sage to get that uh, like to construct? Uh, uh, yeah, that's yeah, that's a great question. Yeah. Um. Actually, no. For Sage, what we did is we we handed Sage we asked it for edge weights here, and we essentially we gave it the rules for edge weights, and we asked Sage to go through and, and calculate that. And that actually that highlights maybe a a thing that I know some of my co-authors really liked is that kind of each thing that we did here. I kind of used a different characterization or way to think about the type cone. So some things we needed edge weights, some things we needed, you know, tr facet translation. And and here, this this McMullen result is kind of different from those. Yeah. Thanks. Um, so so let me tell you what we can say with this, Gail. Uh, or excuse me, with this McMullen result. Well, we can start with a polytope. And we only need our polytope to be combinatorially isomorphic to a product of simplices. So, so it's like I take my, my polytope. Okay, so that one before that triangular prism was a product of simplices, but anything, right? So this is like, right? So the, the geometry could get a little bit weird. So for example, excuse me, for example, if I take any combinatorial cube, so even those ones, the Clementi ones that have been slightly perturbed or the, the quite wild ones where I have opposing facets, anything that is combinatorially isomorphic to the product of simplices has the simplest possible type cone. It's just a simplex itself. So in other words, right, this is a simplicial type cone. Okay, and there are two things that I think that really stood out to me when we when we finished this. Um, so this is this is our theorem for the record, right? This is Joseph, um, excuse me, Federico, Joseph, myself, Mike, and and Lee. And and one thing, this is as far as I know, and perhaps others will um, be able to tell me otherwise. As far as I know, this is the only sort of type cone result. This is dangerous. This video is is going to live on in perpetuity. So if I if I make a false claim here, um, it's on the internet forever, right? Um, that, as far as I know, this is the only type cone result that is up to, you know, invariant up to combinatorial isomorphism, right? In all of the other cases, if I hadn't, you know, if I hadn't started with the regular dodecahedron, it would have been a completely different type cone. Even in that, that pentagon case, right? You have the, the pentagon that I showed us and I moved around, if you take a regular pentagon, it has a different uh, type cone. If you take a pentagon that looks kind of like a little house, right? So, so this pentagon, there, there's a pentagon, this pentagon, the regular one, and then like this pentagon, where I have like straight sides here, these all have different, oh, 
type polytopes, as long as I remember. At least these two do. It's possible that it's possible that the Pentagon is small enough that that's not actually the case. But I believe that in that this is the case, right? So even even for n gons, right? The geometry really matters here. What this is saying is no. Any type cone that you can recognize as combinatorially, excuse me, any polytope that you can recognize as combinatorially uh, isomorphic to a product of simplices. So think those weird cubes, or think you know something that is also equally strange, like. This still has an incredibly simple type cone. All the deformations, yes, they're different deformations, but they actually just are kind of as simple as you could possibly hope. Um, and the other thing that I, I want to highlight from very back to the beginning of when I started talking about type cones, I also mentioned uh, this realization space thing where Karim Adepresito, Danny Kamal Kamalovich, and Aran Nevo proved that um, realization spaces of cubes and actually in more generality uh, products of simplices were also contractible. So this really kind of mirrors their result. It's not, one doesn't imply the other as far as I know, perhaps there's something that no one has, has pieced together. Uh, as far as I know, they're, they're kind of independent, but it really does mirror this result on realization spaces. Of uh, I'll just say cubes, but in more generality, uh, product of simplices as well. Okay, um, and so maybe since I have just a couple minutes left, just to give you a broad, brief overview of kind of what happens, um, and you'll notice my color scheme. Uh, so I started this new university. Our, our official colors are all various shades of blue here. So I, I had to try to stick to school spirit, but recognize there are three different colors here. Uh, they're labeled by the X's, the Y's, and the Z's. And the idea is, if I start with a polytope that is combinatorially isomorphic to a product of simplices, I can get out of this a point configuration. And kind of my point configuration will have different colors. So, so my point configuration will have some light blue, some dark blue, some medium blue. And what I do now is I pick out of my light dark, and let me at least pick a different color. What I do is I start picking what are called rainbow simplices. So a rainbow simplex is I take a, a vertex of each color, and then I take their convex hull. So it gives me uh, this object right here. And then maybe I take a different rainbow simplex. So maybe I take this one, this one, and this one. And I take their convex hull. And so I, I get this point configuration. They're different colored based on what simplex essentially they came from. And then I, I intersect all possible ones where I take a color from each, each simplex. And when I do this, the nice, happy answer, and this doesn't work in general. If I take other, if I try to play this game with other sorts of polytopes, I can uh, run into point configurations that don't have in this. But when I take all configurations and intersect them, it eventually works down to just give me a simplex. And you might remember going back to this, um, Gale result, that's exactly what I'm doing here is I'm doing some sort of, I'm intersecting a ton of different things, exactly these, these co-facets, right? Once I make this, once I make this translation to the polar, to the Gale, and then, and then apply this. And so what's exactly happening here is saying, ah, the intersection of all these is simplex. We apply McMullen's result. And this says the type cone, the type polytope, in fact, is as simple as possible. It is simplicial. So that's, I think, where I'll end. I want to thank you all again for, for attending and it's been it's been great to be part of the seminar. Thank you. Let's thank the speaker. So any questions from the online audience? Oh, hi, Bennett. Uh, hi. Thanks for the nice talk. Um, thank you. My question is just um, so all these uh, type polytopes for these for cubes, for example, mm -hmm. they're all combinatorially a simplex, but is it true that all the deformed polytopes represented by those points in the type polytope are, are combinatorial equivalent as well? I mean, oh, um, oh, that's a great question. I think the answer is going to be no. Oh, really? Um, yeah. So, so for example, if I look, so here's here's like the standard cube. Here's this Klee Minty cube. Um, yeah, I think I think the answer is no. Um, but even if so, for example, if I take this. So here's the, the two cube um, versus this two cube, which 
has this. So notice this is the same sort of phenomenon that was happening before, where in three dimensions, it's here I have these opposing facets that are perpendicular. So here I think I can I can deform this one to eventually get. Right, I kind of I just push say this this one up, and I eventually get a triangle. And so, so this is not combinatorially isomorphic to any deformation I get over here, but there is somehow some correspondence between these type cones here. There's maybe just like not a natural one. I see, I see. Okay, thanks. Yeah, thank you. Any other question? Oh. Yeah, maybe I'll, I'll just ask. So what if you, you have a product of Simplices, but maybe you substitute in in one of them. You allow a polygon. Ah, you know what? <laughs> oh yeah. Um. Well, I can. This is probably still being recorded, right? Well, let me let me. If you if you want me to stop. No, me. no, no. Let me. Well, here here is my question, which is which is really related to to Marge's question. Um, question. What if? Um. So it's a similar sort of thing. Yeah. If I if I take this. Okay. I have instead of a product of simplices. How far can we get from this? And and I don't know in this sort of setup how it would go. But perhaps perhaps yeah, replacing a single, um, you know, single simplex to a polygon, we might that might you know be kind of tame enough that we could we could say something really nice there. Um, I, I don't know off the top of my head though. But one one thing I will say that I would love to know the answer to, and I don't. I personally don't see how I could get to this from our, our proof idea is, well, what about instead of product of simplices? Question, what about product of simplicial polytopes? So a, a simplicial polytope just meaning every, every proper face is a simplex. These ones also in dimension three and higher have um, trivial type cones, right? Any simplicial polytope, it doesn't, there's no way to, to deform it anything other than just to get down to a point. Um, so they're, they're like simplices in that. Could I play somehow the same game here? Maybe this proof could be modified. And I'll say since we're in a, in a Matroid seminar, right? I mean, there's this point configuration hanging out. Like, can I somehow translate this into the language of oriented Matroids to, to bump up the, the goal of the um, power of this proof? And yeah, I would. I, I like the polygon thing too. I, my hope is that we could say something there too. I, I have one more question, if I, if I may. Oh, uh, please. So, uh, I remember you said um, if you somehow if you take the convex hull of some points and the type polytope and the origins in the interior, then you get a that corresponds to a sum and or something is, is that right so that's that's specifically for these polygons right if i take the facet normals and right. I, I play this game i, I take these that it's going to correspond to something in my type cone oh that's oh that's only for the uh, yeah it's only for polygons um this is another thing yeah i it's possible that the same result would tr would be true for like higher spheres but i right i don't know i mean if there's i don't know is if it, any it, oh, sorry. It's possible to so I, I I guess just for polygons maybe this is easy but I, my question was is it possible to see a complete decomposition like to get the Q and the R? Um, oh yeah 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 that's I think that's the case too I think you should actually just take um, so for example here so I think this specific Q and R doesn't work but I think if you take complements that probably should work here um, so for example if R is is these let me see if I can do an easier one. So Q was was that was were those two vertices. If I take, you know, maybe you call it Q prime, this one is in the interior. Um, I would have to double check. I haven't thought about this in a while, but probably Q plus Q prime, I think is probably going to equal well P. So I think I think you can read this off. It's possible that I've read it off poorly in the moment. Yeah, that's that's a great point too, though. And I don't know, I would love. It's possible that you can do this in higher dimensions, but it's just not as helpful. But my sense is, and again, if Federico or Joseph or Mike or Lee is in here, they can call me out on this right away. I would think that it's it's potentially possible to do do the same sort of thing in in higher dimensions with you know take my facet normals, put them on a sphere, and intersect. But probably one, it's not as helpful, and two, it might just be completely false. 
thank you. I, I, yeah. I, I'm sorry, I have to run now. I have some students waiting for office hours, but thank you for the very nice talk. I appreciate it. Oh, thank you. So, um, any other questions? So, Bennett, I have a question. So, um, so I mean, cube we can cube is also an example of a of a zonotope. So, mm. can we? How does this generalize for the? Like, well, the yeah. Let's see. So, a zonotope. Can you think about this as? Uh, well, I'm gonna. Um, well, I guess a zonotope is not a product. Is it a Minkowski sum of line segments? Is that right? Yes. Yes. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, Hmm. Um, so I think, so one thing I think that this, and again, this is just a, as, as a, the hour goes on, I'll say things that are less and less likely to be true. But if you look at this picture, right, I mean, you see, you see in this type cone or type polytope, right? For example, if I want the type polytope of my Minkowski summand, uh, of one of my Minkowski summands, it's living here too. So for example, here is the type polytope of 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 this of this real piece right there, right? So I can I can, and actually I um I spent some time this week trying to think about making this more matroidal. And one thing I'll say in general for this is a, a side note: you can think about this ambient space where the type polytope or the type cone lives as you know this is like kind of my abstract facet space. You can think about this actually as being tiled by many 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 oriented matroids, and you can think about this further as you know. You chop up the type polytope, and and it also gives you all these different orient matroids. But I think that probably you can use this structure. But maybe I'm thinking of it exactly backwards, right? That if I have a polytope P, it's Minkowski sum, and its type polytope lives naturally in there on the boundary here. Um, so, is this immediately apply, uh, applicable to zonotopes, or is it the other way around? I would have to think about that for a second. But I, I would think that you probably can say something there too. And I'll say there are several. Um, so the, this um, paper on these simplicial type cones, they were looking at, at graph isosahedra, I believe, though it could be a different one. There have been several in the past three or four years, papers on saying, oh, here are various different permutahedra, things like that. And I think it's possible that zonotopes have come up in one of these papers, but I, I don't off the top of my head know. OK. Thanks. OK, so um, uh, if there are no other questions, or we can ask the questions off the record. Uh, so I'll stop. Right. Recording. Yeah. Stop the recording and I'll, yeah, I'll say yeah, all I really want. Thank you.